thank you for the introduction. And as you already said, I will be talking about the temporal linkability of microRNA expression profiles. And I'll start with, with a quick primer on microRNA, microRNAs, and microRNA expression. So actually, microRNAs are part of the research field of epigenetics, and um, microRNAs are small non-coding RNA molecules which regulate most of the human genes. And that means that they regulate basically what a cell does and also what type of cell it is. And microRNA expression, this is just real valued number for each of these microRNAs which quantifies how much of these microRNAs are active in a given cell or tissue. And let's have a look at the most interesting properties of microRNAs. So microRNAs are highly influenced by external factors such as aging, diet, environmental chemicals, or also childhood development. And as these external factors change over time, also the microRNA expression changes over time. Also, microRNA expression reflects the health status of a person. Um, they influence highly how a cell works and what kind of cell it is. And as such, it is unsurprising that biomedical researchers found associations between microRNA expression and various severe diseases such as cancers or heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, and so on. So let's have a look at a comparison between DNA and microRNAs. So while DNA contains mostly the blueprint of the body, every cell in the human body con contains the same DNA. And so it just tells the cell what it potentially can do. The microRNAs, they uh, tell the cell what it really does, and they regulate the gene expression. Or in a computer analogy, it would be like DNA is the hardware of the body, whereas the microRNAs are the software of the body. And while DNA is fixed over time, except for rare mutations, the microRNAs, as they're influenced by these external factors, they change quite a lot. And DNA can predict the risk of getting certain diseases sometimes, but microRNA actually it reflects the health status and can tell whether you carry a specific disease at a given point in time. Finally, the last difference between those is that DNA actually has been researched a lot so far, as you can, for example, see in this survey from 2014. So it is quite remarkable that microRNAs uh, have, have been largely overlooked so far, despite being so, um, so influential on our health status. And when we started our research on microRNA expressions and also the linkability, we asked biomedical researchers what they think about potential privacy threats. And they said, actually, this temporal variability of these microRNA expressions shields them from any privacy threat. And that was one of the motivations why we also started with this line of work. So this is the end of the primer. And we can go to the actual research questions I will answer in this talk. Of course, this research is based on microRNA expression-based data, uh, as it is used in a lot of studies nowadays and also in hospitals. So it's also increasingly used in the medical practice. And the first question we're going to tackle is that the microRNA expressions are actually linkable over time. So if they are vulnerable to linkability attacks, and we're going to look at two different attacks. Um, I will go into the details later on. So, and if we find out that these are vulnerable to these kind of linkability attacks, can we protect this kind of data? And of course, if we protect the data, we also have to be careful that if we protect the data still, this data is somehow useful for researchers, also for making a diagnosis. So these will be the three main research questions I'm going to answer. But let's first have a look at how an adversary could get this kind of data in the first place. So typically, a person goes to the hospital, they take a blood or cell sample or tissue sample of that person, and they measure these microRNA expression profiles. And then, depending on whether it's done for research or just to make a diagnosis, the data could be, for example, uh, be uploaded online into a public research database, which everyone can access. 
Of course, they strip off the names of the patients, but still everyone can, for example, on this gene expression omnibus download micron A expression profiles of real persons. Moreover, this kind of data is also increasingly available on the black market. For example, between 2014 and 2015, cyber attacks against healthcare companies have increased by more than 72%, and since 2015, already more than 400 breaches of medical data have been reported only in the US. The largest of them may be the one of Anthem, where almost 80 million records of patients have been leaked. So let's have a look what the adversity then can do with this kind of data. The first attack we are going to study in this work is a very targeted one called identification attack, where we have the sample of one person and we want to find this person, for example, in a public research database. And of course, the samples can be from different points in time. And also, it could be that the sample we have is from the person where the person was healthy, and we want to find out whether now it, it has a certain disease um, by just looking at uh, whether, where, whether we can find that person again in the public research database. And the second kind of attack we're looking at is more broad, and so we have actually two databases, and we want to find the corresponding samples. So which sample from the left-hand side corresponds to which sample from the right-hand side, so to say. And we carry out these two attacks on two different data sets. The first one consisting of 29 participants, healthy athletes, and the um, samples have been taken before and after exercising, and the time period in between is exactly one week. And we measured more than 1,000 of these different micron A's from blood and plasma-based samples of these athletes. The second data set we used contains uh, 26 participants, all of them lung cancer patients. And there we have much more points in time, to be exact eight. And the uh, time period in between of the consecutive ones is always three months. But you, so we measure, measured again the same number of micronase, but only on plasma-based samples. If you now would say, okay, this kind of data set seems to be small, actually it's quite huge for these kinds of longitudinal studies. You have to know that one sample, for example, one plasma-based sample of one person at one point in time already costs several hundred dollars. And also, every of these 26 participants has to go to the hospital every three months and cannot just skip one appointment because of a birthday party or something like that. So this is actually one of the largest data that's available out there. And since we have this huge number of micronase measured, we first process, pre-process this data uh, to get a smaller number of dimensions. And one reason for that is because some of these micronase are possibly correlated, and the other reason is because some of these micronase are just uninteresting for linking them over time. And what we do is we apply a principal component analysis with whitening, which first of all provides us with unit variance. Also, it condenses the data into a smaller dimensional T, M, and we have to choose this M, and also the components of the resulting vector are then um, uncorrelated. Uh, on the right top corner, you see this RKTJ, and this is just the notation for such a vector of all the micron A expression values uh, of the individual K at time point TJ. And then this principal component analysis out of this vector produces another vector where all the components, so there we have only M components, and all the components are linear combinations of the alt vector. And one main advantage of PCA is that it tries to condense the data into these smaller dimensionality uh, with minimal information loss. Okay, let's have a look at the first attack, this targeted one, um, called identification attack. There we have on the left-hand side, so in this illustration on the right-hand side, but the left-hand side blue dot, the sample of the one target victim we want to find in the database on the right-hand side. And we use the pre-processed data, so these vectors of the, we get out of the PCA, and we measure the Euclidean distance between this victim and each entry in the database. 
and we choose that one as corresponding that minimizes the Euclidean distance. So let's have a look at the results we get out of that. This graph on, on the left-hand side shows um, on the x-axis the number of PCA dimensions we choose, so this m, and on the y-axis it shows the success rate, and that is the percentage of successfully identified individuals. And the blue bars, so it's measured on the first data set, the blue bars uh, is the success rate based on the plasma-based samples, and the potentially red bars, but they look a bit weird here, um, they are uh, the success rate on the blood-based samples. And we can see that we can achieve success rate of up to 76% on the blood-based samples, and the success rate for the plasma-based samples is lower. It's uh, around 30%, maybe. But still, for the blood-based samples, we're able to achieve quite a high success rate here. And now we compare these plasma-based samples, the blue bars, with the plasma-based samples from a second data set. Remember that we have eight time points, which means that we can measure the success rate between all of them, for example, between the first and the second, and also the first and the third, and so on. And so we can get, actually, a lot of different success rates. And in this graph, we show the minimum and the average of all these, of these combinations and all the, the maximum. And there we can see that the highest uh, average success rate we can achieve between these combinations is around 22%, whereas there are also some combinations of time points where we can get a success rate of up to 42%. And if you consider that the time period between these sample series um, at least three months, it's still quite reasonable what we get there and also comparable to what we had on the other data set using the plasma-based samples. And if we compare them side by side, we can find some other interesting observations. For example, uh, the highest success, success rates in both data sets occur at a similar number of PCA dimensions. And also, if you look at the principal components we get, off, got, get out of the PCA, um, we see a huge overlap between the micronase there. And that basically means that an adversary could first quite easily guess a good number of PCA dimensions and also knows that the same micronase probably um, lead to a good high success rate for him. Okay, let's move on to the second attack, the uh, matching attack. So here we have two databases. By the way, they don't have to be equal in size, but for simplicity in this talk, I will assume exactly that. If you want to know more about the other case, I refer to the paper. And in the illustration on the right-hand side, uh, I denoted both databases. So, um, as, so each database uh, is a set of nodes here. For example, the blue nodes are the, is the database from time point T1, and the green nodes is the other database. And then we want, of course, to minimize the, we want to find an assignment that minimizes the sum of the Euclidean distances, uh, written as a formula that looks like this. And if we represent this as a graph, as shown on the right-hand side, as a bipedal graph, we can apply a graph algorithm that runs in n to the power of three, and we get out as an assignment that could look like that. So we get an assignment that minimizes the sum of the Euclidean distances. Let's have a look at the results we get out of this matching attack. So the structure of the diagrams is the same as before, but now it's the different attack. And here, remarkably, we are able to achieve for the blood-based samples and success rate up to 90%. Again, the plasma-based samples perform a bit worse, but still, uh, almost 50% there. If you compare that with the other data set, again, it's quite comparable with 30% uh, on, on average as the highest success rate there. And there are also some combinations of time points where we get more than 50, actually 55% um, of success rate. Again, also here, the number of PCA dimensions between both data sets where we get high success rates is quite similar and also there's an overlap between the principal components. So the main takeaway of this slide probably is that 
we get on these blood-based samples a success rate up to 90%. And using these data sets, we also post other questions. For example, we tried to extrapolate uh, the results for larger data sets, so to see uh, how it evolves if we would have larger databases available. And in this graph on the right-hand side, you see on the x-axis the size of the data set that we artificially vary, and the blue line, again, is, uh, are the plasma-based samples on the first data set, and the red line are the blood-based samples. And we see that the success decreases quite sharply for the uh, plasma-based samples, but for the blood-based samples, it's almost linearly. And if you extrapolate that to, for example, 120 participants, we see that for the blood-based samples, we still have a success rate of up to 60%. Another question we looked at was, um, how does the success rate evolve with the time period in between the samples? So if the time period between the samples is three months or six months and so on. And so this is measured on the second data set, and there we see, again, minimum average and maximum success rate for increasing time periods. And the red line in the middle, the average shows that it almost stays constant within the first year and even within the first 15 months. And if we now take all of these results together and look again at this common belief of uh, a lot of biomedical researchers that there are no privacy threats, I think that we clearly have shown that there are privacy threats and this belief is just unjustified. And this was then the motivation for us to go further and try to, try to protect this kind of data. And for that, uh, we investigated two different countermeasures I will present now. The first one, probabilistically sanitizing micron expression profiles. And that means we add noise to the data in a, probabilistic, uh, in a probabilistically and fully distributed and also differentially private manner, providing what we call EPG no indistinguishability. And to do that, we draw noise from a multivariate Laplacian mechanism. And then, if we added this noise to the data, the data could potentially be published online, for, for example, in these research databases. But sometimes randomization or perturbing the data is simply not an option. For example, if you want to have a diagnosis in the hospital, the doctors will simply refuse to add noise to the data because that could, of course, somehow influence uh, the diagnosis and that is not something you want. And therefore, we also investigated the second countermeasure of hiding non-relevant micron expressions and non-relevant means non-relevant, for example, for the diagnosis because only some of the micron A's are associated with the disease. And also this countermeasure has one downside. I will go into detail of that in a second. Um, there are correlations between micron A's, and that means even if we publish only a subset, you could use the correlations to infer information about the hidden ones. And as I hinted at in the research questions, we are not only trying to prevent the linkability of the samples, but we also have to look at the utility of the data. So we want to preserve the accuracy of a classification uh, of a diagnosis as diseased or healthy. And usually the biomedical researchers in the field use a radial SVM classifier, as shown in the illustration below. So this red circle indicates the diseased persons, and we have two of them in the circle, and the other are, li are lying around. And then if we add noise to the data, of course, the points could move, and suddenly one person that was actually healthy is classified as diseased, and one person that is actually diseased is now classified as healthy. And we want to print that, and therefore we measure also the accuracy of such a classification on another data set. This other data set has a lot of participants, more than 1,000, but only one point in time. And one, each of these participants is, uh, has one of 19 different diseases. Okay, let's have a look at the results. The results I will present in a second look similar to that. So, here we have a disease, for example, multiple sclerosis, and a blue line indicating the accuracy of such a classification, and the 99.2% are the maximum achievable accuracy here for a subset of 
uh, 40 micronase, for example. Then we also have a red line that indicates the success rate. Uh, all right, and on the x-axis we vary, of course, the number of published micronase expressions. And for the success rate, we assume the worst case scenario. And that is, we use the matching attack, and we assume that the adversary knows the best number of PCA dimensions to use for this attack. And then if you have both of these lines, we try to find a good trade-off between the accuracy and the privacy or the uh, success of the attack. And for example, for multiple sclerosis here, uh, we think that this could be a good trade-off. So at seven micron A's, the success decreases relatively to the 90% that are maximum uh, possible by 54%. And the accuracy in this example decreases by only 1%. Let's have a look at another disease. Here, glioma, the accuracy, the baseline accuracy, so these 92.7% here, uh, yeah, it should be a point. Um, it's actually below what we had for multiple sclerosis, but that's just disease related. And here we can find a trade off at this position, for example. So we only publish four micronase, but we get a success decrease by 80%. And again, as for the case of multiple sclerosis, the accuracy decreases by only 1%. And now I'll add to this graph also what happens if we assume that the adversary can infer correlations perfectly. So we have now another uh, line in there. And there we assume, for example, if one micron A is published in the line below, that now the adversary in, uh, knows perfectly all the correlated micron A's. And there we see that the success can have a gap between these of more than 20%. And so one has really be, has to be careful when uh, hiding micronase that uh, one also takes into account possible correlations and further, further research into this area of these correlations between micronase is needed. So let's move on to the other countermeasure, the probabilistic sanitization. Again, the structure of the graph is similar to before, but now on the x-axis we have the amount of noise which is determined by the privacy parameter epsilon. And this is again multiple, scler multiple sclerosis, as we had before. And here we think that this could be a good trade-off. And if you compare that side by side with the hiding mechanism, we see that the red line, which is the success rate and is inversely proportional to the privacy, is here lower than on the left-hand side for the hiding. And that actually means that the privacy with the noising on the right-hand side is better. And if we compare it in numbers, we see that in this trade-off, the success now decreases by 63%, whereas for the hiding, it decreased by 54%. And the accuracy decreases here by 0.65%, whereas for the hiding, it decreased by 1%. And we can get even better for other diseases. So for example, here, stomach tumor, um, we can find a good trade-off at this position where the success decreases by 70%, while the accuracy decreases by only 0.2%. And if we now take these results, they can look at our research questions. I think that we successfully answered the first research question so are micron expression profiles vulnerable to lickability attacks? As yes, they are. Up to 90% success rate uh, for blood-based samples should convince everyone who thinks that they are not linkable. Okay, if yes, and it was yes, how can we protect this kind of data? Noising would be, for example, one option, but as I said, sometimes it's not an option, and there we propose the hiding. And using the noising, we can often uh, reduce the success of the attacks uh, to almost random guessing. And finally, can the, uh, can the protection mechanism somehow preserve the utility of the data? Is it still useful for diagnosis or for research? And there we saw in our evaluations, at least on our data sets, that noising in general provides a better yet privacy utility trade-off 
um, in our data set for 17 out of 19 diseases. And most often, for most of the diseases, the privacy could be doubled, whereas the utility decreased by less than 1%. So I thank you for listening to my talk, and I hope that you have some interesting questions. All right, we have, uh, we have time for a few questions. Hi, I was wondering whether you guys, uh, Stefan Soria from Microsoft Research, great talk, interesting. I, I do not know a lot about this area. I guess it's some of, many of us don't. Uh, I, I was wondering whether you've tried to look at um, economic cost of these things, to try to do like sort of, sort of you know, cost analysis as to when you lose, so for example, your statement here on this slide that it appears on several sides, utility cost is less than 1%. Yeah. Can I put the dollar amount to that? What does that mean? Yeah, so utility, we measure the utility as um, the... So, so the question is clearly, you know, losing privacy, uh, there is a cost to that. And one way to measure yeah. cost is to dollars. I'm not saying it's the best way. I'm not saying that's the only way. That's one way people do it in practice. And, and, and so, so you lose privacy. On the other hand, doing this kind of medical analysis, we gain something. Right? There are some yeah. diagnostics you talked about. So that's, again, you can look at that as terms of, in terms of dollars. So, so I was wondering whether you could do some sort of economics analysis where you can sort of trade off these dollars and see what the right balance is. This seems like a very interesting approach. We did not do this. Um, I think it's quite hard to do it because um, how would you uh, somehow measure the uh, the cost in dollar for privacy because you don't know of real attacks maybe and you don't know how the attacker uh, in the end uses the data so it's hard to measure that by talking to people who think about these things like yeah yeah okay thanks thanks <laughs> Hi, uh, Jonathan Walsh, Lockheed Martin. Uh, this is very interesting. I wonder, it seems to me that this could be applicable to a lot of different categories of this type of data. I wonder if you could comment on if there are other types of medical data like this that your approach could help make these types of determinations and assist in increasing privacy in those areas. So yes, I also think that it's applicable to other kinds of data. Uh, we did not look into other kinds of data yet, uh, but we're planning to also uh, apply this to other kinds of epigenetic data and other medical data in general, yes. Uh, Pascal, in your countermeasures, uh, you use the accuracy of your matching attack as, uh, as a metric for privacy. Uh, can you make a case for why this particular matching attack is an optimal attack for an adversary who is aware of your defense mechanism? So I wouldn't say that it's an optimal uh, attack. I would think that you could uh, potentially improve this attack. So it's rather a lower bound for an adversary. And um, actually, I'm pretty sure that you can still improve the attack. Uh -huh. All right, uh, very, very exciting and disciplinary work. Uh, well, this brings us to an end of the privacy session as well as in, and for this conference. Uh, let's thank all the first speakers once again.